Uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Iman Lakhani and I'm the communications officer for the Center for Excellence in Journalism. Um, CJ is, specializes in providing professional development trainings for journalists in Pakistan. Over the years, we've trained over 2,000 journalists from across the country, doing both uh, in-person trainings and you know online trainings. Some of the some of the topics that we've done include digital entrepreneurship, humanitarian reporting, investigative reporting, peace reporting, and along with social media trainings and others. And CJ also offers a mentor, mentoring and you know, fellowship programs. Uh, this discussion is organized with, uh, in partnership with the Global Investigative Journalism Network. And the session will be moderated by Amal Ghani who I'll just pass on to, to introduce everyone else. Okay, great. Thanks, Iman. Uh, so I'd just like to begin by introducing GIJN first. GIJN, or the Global Investigative Journalist Network, is uh, an international network of journalists. Uh, our main work is to provide free resources and trainings to journalists throughout the world. We publish in over 12 languages, and we work with journalists in over 100 countries across the world. Our work is available uh, to journalists across the world free of cost, and they can also reach out to us in the form of queries or questions if they need help with like a specific issue or a specific topic. Today, what we're discussing specifically is uh, funding investigative, uh, in investigative or independent journalism in South Asia, because we've seen uh, censorship uh, across South Asia uh, worsen over the past few years across all, indi all, across all indexes. And we've also seen that the mainstream media is really not kind of highly highlighting or doing the, uh, doing the work it should be. So in an atmosphere like this, where censorship is increasing, uh, how do you fund in independent, uh, independent journalism? Uh, to discuss that today, we have a, a, a great panel with us. We have Badr Alam, who is the editor of Sujak. Uh, Sujak is a nonprofit independent news organization that is based in Pakistan. Uh, they focus on stories that are overlooked by mainstream media, and uh, their aim is to focus on marginalized voices or voices from the margin. We also have with us Dilrukshi. Dilrukshi is the executive director for the Center for Investigating Reporting in Sri Lanka, and we're very grateful that Dilrukshi is joining us today, given everything that is happening in Sri Lanka at the moment, uh, to take out the time and be a part of a conversation like this. Uh, she is a multiple award-winning journalist. Um, she has over 25 experience of journalism. Uh, journalism experience and her work has uh, appeared in a wide range of outlets, including The Guardian, Al Jazeera, and Reuters. We also have with us Sunil. Sunil is the Chief Executive Officer at the Independent and Public Spirited Media Foundation that provides funding to organizations, uh, and their aim is to create more public interest journalism. Uh, and uh, fund organizations that are also doing work uh, that is of public interest. We also have with us Munize Jahangir. Munize is the co-founder and editor of an independent media organization in Pakistan called Voice PK. Uh, they focus specifically on watchdog journalism, human rights violations in the country. Uh, Munize also has a, uh, has a lot of experience in journalism and she's also the host of a current affairs show called Spotlight with Munize Jahangir. Uh, thank you everybody for being a part of our panel here today uh, and taking out time despite uh, the various issues that are occurring in our countries. Uh, so I think, uh, Badr, I'd like to open the conversation with you. Uh, and what we're going to do at the beginning of the conversation is sort of take a few minutes. Uh, I'd like the speakers to take a few minutes to outline uh, what their organization is, what the mandate of their organization is, and why they sort of started their organizations uh, in their in their own respective countries. So, Badr, let's start with you on, the, on that front. Thank you, Amal. Uh, Lok Sujag started with the sole purpose of uh, doing stories, which means Okay, so I think Badr was having some connectivity issues earlier uh, because there's like an electricity problem in happening in pa across Pakistan right now. Uh, Munizil, let's go to you. Let's talk about voice a little bit. Uh, what, uh, what was the purpose of starting an independent media organization? Uh, what, is the like, what is the purpose behind it? What is sort of your vision for the, for the organization itself? Well, um, 
I've been working as a journalist since 2004, and it's basically been in mainstream media um, in India and in Pakistan. Uh, so, but what we started noticing when we began reporting um, is that when we used to report, it used to be about people's stories. And slowly and steadily all across South Asia, in fact, even I think even in the Western media, it became about statement journalism. And the story of the people was lost. So um, myself and a couple of other journalists, Dari, uh, one of them who's, who's also part of this webinar, and she's one of the listeners, and uh, a couple of other journalists, we got together and we formed voicepk.net also to support AGHS Legal Aid Cell, which is a pro bono legal aid, uh, all female legal aid firm, which began in the 1980s by, by my mother, Asma Jahangir, uh, who was one of the co-founders. And we wanted to give the victims, victims of violence, women, children, minorities, a voice, because we noticed that the victims who came to us, when their plight was highlighted by the media and they suddenly found a voice, that the law enforcement agencies noticed them. And when we would go with them to lodge an FIR, in some cases, we would not even be allowed to, we would not be able to lodge an FIR for months. But when, the situa when, when that woman or that child or that minority was caught on a, a camera and there was an involvement of the media, uh, they suddenly had a voice and suddenly law enforcement agencies reacted to them very differently. So we, it was an organic uh, mix basically between what lawyers were doing and what journalists were doing. And we were, uh, we were both focusing on human rights issues across Pakistan and helping uh, people who were suffering from, um, you know, uh, violence, et cetera, and providing them legal aid. So all of that happened very organically because we are housed in the same uh, building. And therefore, the young lawyers, all of them in the 20s and 30s, started working together. Um, so I think that that was why we started it, because we wanted to tell the story of the people of Pakistan and the people of South Asia. And then it began and, and then it became organically into this portal where we would not just be telling the story, but also advocating uh, in the National Assembly and the Senate in Pakistan's parliament with policymakers, with uh, law enforcement agencies, and, uh, you know, uh, trying to give a voice to uh, some of the people who came to us. Thank you for the introduction, Manise. Um, okay, so Dilrukshi, would you sort of speak a little bit about your uh, organization and what was the thought behind forming something like it? Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's, it's really good to connect with everyone. So the Center for Investigative Reporting was uh, officially set up in the latter part of 2018. We are really brand new. Like, we don't have count many years. But it was coming for, for a long time. We've been thinking about it. Uh, many of us have practiced as investigative journalists indiv individually within uh, you know, mainstream legacy media houses. And uh, it, it's it's common to the region that you know the pol shifts in uh, the political shifts and the situation, the economic pressure, all of that does impact uh, the general you know general uh, storytelling and how how news uh, newsrooms are run. So there was a time when the political pressures were so high, and eventually we moved out of mainstream as well. And we spent some time thinking about uh, developing a model where we can overcome uh, several difficulties. One is the, uh, the, the kind of political pressure that can come through your news, uh, newsroom itself, the, the pressures of the masters. And the second thing is also about there are a lot of, we, we wanted to not just work within a newsroom where you work with a group of journalists, but we also wanted to work with any num you know, number of journalists who are working for multiple organizations. So it seemed that, and, and we used to be trainers and many people used to come and uh, get trained by us, you know, whenever we were uh, training for other organizations, they would, uh, they would actually come up with a request for setting up an organization. So I would say that we were being responsive. We were also ready at that time. So uh, we decided to set up the, uh, set up the center for investigative reporting. So we also understood by working with journalists, that uh, this is not to say that there is the, there is 
you know bad journalism in Sri Lanka but there are there are opportunities within the mainstream for people to do investigative journalism and there is good journalism happening still in certain places and there are brilliant journalists still in Sri Lanka but you also need to have a dedicated space we felt where anybody can come and anybody can get mentored and in any country there are people who have access to knowledge and technology and then you also have people who don't have that access so we wanted to create a place where anybody was uh, free to come and if you wanted to get trained we, we started running courses which were very popular our courses are pretty popular the trainings are popular so we would definitely ask anyone who wants to work with us in terms of developing stories to come through that channel uh, get your basics right and then we do stories and we do not compete uh, we support media houses we uh, work with others Thank you, Guruji, for that uh, introduction. Badr, if your internet is working now, could we hear from you for a little bit? Yes, I'm really sorry for all the interruptions. We are having a massive uh, power failure right now. Uh, and I'm on a backup uh, power supply at the moment. So the internet is still very unstable. So just to briefly introduce uh, Lok Sujag to everyone, we are a very new organization. The current website of loksujag.com came into being only last year in the middle of last year. And, uh, but the people working with Lok Sujag or the founders of the Lok Sujag, including myself and Tahir Mary, are not uh, uh, really very young people. I am in my 50s, Tahir is in his early 60s. So uh, in that sense, we are an exception to the rule of the startups that we're not young. But uh, we have learned our lessons by working in the mainstream media for a very long time. My last uh, job was as the editor of Herald Magazine which uh, got shut down in July of 2019. And when that got shut down, we started thinking of setting up uh, a media, an independent media outlet, which can cover things that mainstream media does not cover. As I was saying earlier, our uh, focus is on the voices from the margins of power. We cover people living on the periphery of the power in Pakistan. Uh, we also cover ideas and communities and people who are generally neglected and overlooked in the mainstream media. So, uh, but we do not do it by writing opinion pieces or uh, writing commentary about them or doing uh, uh, sort of interviews or fe feature videos about them. We try to do investigative reports, reports about uh, the people living in the far flung remote areas of the country. And that is what our main focus is. So in, in, in other words, we are trying to do investigative uh, reporting from the margins of power so that the voices of the people who are living at, at those, those margins can be taken to the policy circles and the policy circles and are then made to heard the, those voices because of the force of the reporting that those stories include. And we are also trying to do all of this in a narrative style kind of a journalism, not in a news report kind of journalism so that uh, we can engage the interest of the readers because we found out that news reports in the age of television and in the age of Twitter and Facebook do not really uh, have much shelf value. So you have to have a narrative style in order to engage your readers in a permanent way, in a more stable way. So that is where we come from. I'm really sorry about the, all the interruptions also. Thank you, Badr, for the introduction. Um, okay, so Neil, we'd like to come to you now because you work more on the funding side of things, right? Uh, with your organization. So what sort of ha has, uh, has been your experience and also what was the idea of forming an organization like yours in India, if you could uh, speak about that to begin with. Yes. Uh, hi, th thanks for having me over, uh, Amel. It's good to be on this panel. Uh, th this foundation was started almost about uh, somewhere in 2015-16, so almost about seven or eight years that we are in existence now. Uh, the whole objective then uh, really was from the perspective that mainstream media, some of the points that uh, Dilrukshi has mentioned and Badar has talked about, uh, mainstream media uh, was uh, perhaps constrained from covering issues uh, that did not make sense for them from the point of view of uh, TRPs or or circulation growth and things like that. So uh, there was an issue of trust, I think, in media, which was there. And simultaneously with all these issues that were there, uh, 
the internet online news media had begun to emerge uh, as a force where quite a few young startups uh, began to come about in 2016, 15, 16 onwards. And uh, the foundation realized that if uh, these organizations need to survive and because the internet model was uh, fairly, uh, had not yet developed to that extent where advertising and revenues, of uh, subscription revenues had not yet uh, emerged as strong uh, as strongly as perhaps they are to some extent today. Uh, the foundation felt that we need to look at uh, helping or matching the efforts of some of these people who practice good journalism, those who were there uh, in terms of uh, looking at the journalism from the point of view of saying truth to power or uh, looking at it purely uh, from the perspective of uh, independent journalism covering issues that uh, mainstream media would not want to touch. So uh, we had to, uh, we, we decided that uh, these entities need to be supported. Uh, there were also, uh, the, the background was really that there was, there was a group of philanthropists and there are uh, uh, quite a few of them now uh, in India who felt that uh, one needed to rebuild trust in media and uh, uh, they support us. So the funding from this foundation that goes to in turn to support online news media uh, works on a model which is a sustainability model. We fund them for a few years till they are in a position to uh, be able to uh, break even uh, and be sustainable from a long-term point of view. Thank you, Sunil, for that introduction. Sunil, we're going to stay with you for a bit to sort of talk about, um, so at what stage does a media organization ask for funding? Uh, do they come to you and pitch ideas? Or like you said, are there, uh, do these startups already exist? And then sort of you intervene at a point to help them with, with their financial models? See, it's important for us to know, uh, you, even our name suggests that, Independent and Public Spirited Media Foundation. And so the kind of journalism that uh, these entities practice is something that we are keen to understand. And therefore, we do not uh, fund anyone who come to us with ideas and do initial pitching. So it's not seed funding as much as we would need uh, a proof of uh, the concept uh, or even going beyond that proof of concept to actually uh, be able to uh, have a website, display their content. We know what stories uh, they are doing. We would like to evaluate them on the basis of their journalism. So the journalism is one primary uh, uh, reason why we would want to uh, fund them, but also the sustainability part to what extent uh, this operation is in a position, it looks at their effort from a business point of view, because it's very easy to uh, get onto the net, put your stories on, but to do it in a sustainable way, to make it, uh, to break even and make it a profitable enterprise, uh, that's an important criteria. So we look at how effective they are in terms of looking at that even from a revenue point of view and from the point of view of growth of traffic, how do they go about building their audiences? So all of these three uh, major factors is what uh, we look at uh, before we decide uh, to fund them. So we're going to talk a bit more about sustainability, uh, economic sustainability, specifically later on in the in the webinar. But the Rukshi, since you're a relatively newer organization, I would also uh, like to speak to you about because the purpose is to educate our our, our audience here, right? Uh, when did you, uh, as a founder, go out and start looking for funding? And the three criteria, which is journalism, growth of traffic, and sustainability, that uh, Sunil has mentioned, uh, are these? Did you already have a website up and running, like? 
at what point uh, did you start going out and looking for funding and what did that funding look like initially? Um, so when we set up the organization, we have not started even going to funders. Um, some of the other, other centers, you know, people who were already working at centers and running centers said, you know, you feel very strongly about it, go set it up. And that's exactly what we did. And we set it up and we had this very small, very simple launch ceremony. I would, uh, I would only say that the founders themselves had credibility and uh, were accepted as journalists. And this is not to say that that was the only thing, but uh, uh, we, uh, we, uh, people approached us, said that this is so necessary for Sri Lanka. So I think it also was set up at a time, Amel, that uh, the country felt the need for, uh, you know, muckraking uh, to take a different turn. And, and what are the models you've seen? So when we, whenever we started talking to donors, they were looking at the models that we have already seen. Uh, the, the models, existing models in Sri Lanka were, you know, you have these units, uh, you know, located within mainstream, um, uh, in the mainstream uh, news uh, newsroom. So you have investigate, uh, investigative journals and desks, but uh, this doesn't provide for collaborations, you know, in a, with, within uh, organizations or among journalists. So for us, the model was to be that and that i think worked a lot a lot of people like the fact that we, we were going to do collaborations collaborations across media and uh, among a group of, um, within the community of journalists and also to undertake south asia but as you know uh, as uh, south asian now uh, um so we had two funders uh but the first one, uh, the first uh, bit of support came for fact checking. That's very interesting. This is the other thing. I think uh, we are we are dealing with a lot of misinformation and disinformation. Ten years ago, when I was really a pra practicing investigative journalist, I wouldn't have said that we would have thought about these things. But fact checks have become a big revenue model for a lot of people, a lot of organizations, and I see that. And I've been I, I'm consistently asked for support to set up those. So we had uh, donors, of course, international uh, donors the same people that everybody works with probably and also local donors i think that's important you also have within each of our communities so sonil is a case in point now if we had organizations like yours in sri lanka we're going to be you know a lot lucky we're going to be pretty lucky about having such organizations so local organizations because you can also work with thematic areas so we chose things to work in the area of information literacy to work uh, on health and environment and that was really important and uh, our model also means that we are not going to claim credit for the content we do we are not running a platform yet we would want the journalists to bear credit for what they did and the organization that provides them the platform and that's perfectly fine for us we we simply collaborate and for perhaps our luck this model has worked so far, people have felt that that uh, that approach of not being competitive uh, for the you know larger piece of the pie and uh, you know securing your funding alone uh, instead of sharing it and creating a model that shares it. So that has worked uh, well for us so far, and uh, also cross funding. You can you can work on a team. Uh, and you can not, or you can also have a couple of organizations supporting that, right? So then it, it also creates a space for organizations and even individuals. Not that it has happened so far, but uh, I'm I'm hearing this a lot. You know, people are willing to give you a thousand dollars, then like twenty thousand dollars in in one go. But you have to create that space for people to uh, make donations. Uh, we CIR has so far not had donations, and we have not even promoted that. Uh, because we are currently donor funded, but we see that as with the expansion and continuity of work, people uh, are happy to uh, invest in things that they like. And I think General Sunil said it right. And uh, at a point when we were setting up, I remember uh, the GI Jane, uh, GI Jane core team also gave me one bit of advice. You're running a business. Just don't think about it in any other way. You are definitely doing it for journalism, but there is a business side to it. And if you were just going to close your eyes to that, you're not going to have sustainability. And uh, it's important to understand what do they fund for? Who funds what is important to us? So there are people who, organizations and individuals who want to support human rights and uh, grand, uh, grand corruption, systemic corruption and health and environment. So we have been talking to them uh, across those themes. So that's how we have worked.
Okay, so what I heard through Rukshi is you're saying that A, you're donor funded at the moment. And also uh, when you look to expand, you're looking at collaborations uh, across local newsrooms and also international newsrooms. Uh, so when you talk about cross collaborations that might be funded, are you looking at international collaborations? I'm looking at both and we have already done both. Uh, as I said, Amel, you know, we, we do not uh, run our banner saying CIR funded this kind of thing. We don't. And, and I also think it, it gives a certain sense of cover also. We, it, it protects the people who actually work on those stories as well. And uh, we have done international collaborations. And as I said, as I mentioned, those themes are the ones where we have been strongest because there was a pandemic. And when journalists wanted to really do investigative stories and the organizations did not invest in them. We introduced a fellowship scheme and uh, through the fellowship scheme, but we, uh, we just don't give money. You have to come, come through that, you know, you have to apply for a fellowship. You have to get selected. You also have to go through a couple of webinars of orientations and then you can go on fellowship and you have, you have a support system. You have experts supporting you to, uh, in, um, by way of mentorship. So that, uh, that's, that's how we do, and also publications. I think that's really important. Uh, when we support local journalists who want to do their stories, we are very happy to support them to do their stories and support them to just do the story the way they want. We support financially and with mentorship in, in, in improving the story. And uh, just uh, early a part of this year and last year, we also uh, kind of came into a, a arrangements with some of the international publications and organizations to do collaborations. Our next step definitely is to do uh, South Asian collaborations. We have done it, uh, you know, bilaterally. It's time to do it like, you know, with the multiple countries. That sounds great, the Rukshi collaborations across South Asia. Um, okay, so Badir, uh, could you speak a little bit about Sujag? I know that Sujag, uh, first, like, what was your initial round of funding? What did the organization look like? And how have you restructured it since? Uh, but also, like, I know that you're experimenting with, like, a membership uh, subscriber-based model. What does that look like for you? Thank you, Amal. Uh, Sujag, uh, as a non-governmental organization, has a long history. It came into being in 1997. And it has been doing a lot of work in the development sector, uh, and it uh, continued to exist as a like a very functional NGO in Pakistan until 2018 and 2019. But then in 2019, we decided to convert it into a news media organization. And at that stage, uh, Sujag had a pool of money that it has had it had saved through its previous activities. So that money was kind of a seed money for uh, the news media organization that we were planning to set up. Uh, but there were a number of hurdles that we were facing at, the, at that time. Number one was that the government was not very kind towards NGOs at that time. The NGOs across Pakistan were shutting up and then there was a massive crackdown on uh, the donor funded projects and programs. So uh, we thought that if we continue to exist as an NGO, uh, that kind of regulatory regime might uh, kill us uh, before, even before we are born. So we decided to set up a company owned co jointly owned by myself and my co-founder Tahir Mehdi. So now we are a corporate entity registered uh, with the Securities and Exchange Commission of Pakistan. But the seed money that Sujag had saved from its previous activities became uh, came in very handy for us to to pass through that trans transition. And it has helped us survive until of, uh, until December of 2021. So until that period, we did not have any worries about money. But at the same time, we were also thinking about launching the uh, membership model that you have rightly pointed out. We think that engaging people with your content, with your work is very important in a country like Pakistan, where crackdown on journalists and censorship policies of the government often you know uh, treat the media organizations very very badly so you need a community a group of people uh, a sort of a, a cohort of people who, who can support you not just in terms of giving you money for your operations but also if and when the government tracks down on you they're they're you know they're willing to go out in the streets and chant slogans in favor of you so that kind of idea uh, was uh, was the reason that we started thinking about the uh, membership model. Unfortunately, we have not yet rolled out the membership uh, model. And right now we are surviving on two 
other sources of revenue one is doing some production work for different clients so we produce videos for them or edit contents for them and then they pay us and from the those savings we try to run loksujag.com and we also have a grant for from a foreign donor but our ultimate objective is that we go for the membership model we have already started asking people to become the members of lok sujag by sending them newsletters by having incorporated a page on our website where people can register as members and right now we are not asking them to do anything we are just asking them to engage with our content uh, comment our content rate our content let us know what they like what they don't what what is it that they would like us to cover what is it that that is not being covered in their respective area and sujag can cover because other organizations will not so we have started that window recently and that is a very nascent very uh, kind of fledgling uh, window at this moment but we are hoping that in the coming months and in the coming years membership will be our main source of revenue and people who become members they will not be donating or they will not be subscribing but they will be sort of a community that thinks that this is a journalism that they need to support this is a journalism that is bringing some value to the information that they require or this is the journalism that is taking their voices to the uh, to the power corridor so as a result of all these perceptions they support this journalism so it's not a subscription model per se but it's a subscription plus kind of a model in which the members also engage very very regularly and very very strongly with the newsroom so that is what we are trying to do in pakistan uh, thank you brother so i think the theme that i hear there is that you're trying to build a community that will also then financially support the kind of journalism that you're doing uh, manisha i'll turn to you now because voice is a completely uh, open free to uh, free to the public uh, platform and from, from what you spoke earlier it seems like that is the idea behind it right to like take these marginalized marginalized voices to the larger public uh, in an era where everybody is now almost paywalling how how do you how do you look at an operation like voice like what does your funding look like at the moment and where do you hope to take it well i think that uh, it's very difficult as you've uh, heard from other people as well to keep things like this alive financially and we are constantly looking for funding we are looking for you know we deal with very very small amounts of funds it's not that big but what we do is that we keep on looking for we have one person just looking for funding um i myself have a full time job uh, you know um i'm i'm a, a tv uh, broadcast journalist at a at a mainstream tv station so it's uh, it's it's tough for us um, and all of us who are seniors who are working we are not really paid um so um obviously it's uh, you know it's a struggle to keep it alive um but there you know there are small funds you know these days especially with the ukraine crisis the focus remains uh, uh, not in pakistan and obviously there's been a drain and uh, very you will find very few funding uh, sources which will say that okay we we are wanting to fund a news uh, website or you know a current affairs uh, website so they are more focused towards advocacy which is what we do actually primarily now which is uh, advocacy but i've also realized that the backbone of any good um, outlet media outlet is actually daily news because till you are not checking daily news then you do not know exactly what is happening in the country and you cannot follow trends you cannot follow what is happening on a daily basis so we have a bulletin we have a human rights bulletin which is the first of its kind in pakistan and during the covid we had also a covid bulletin you know so from those bulletins and everyday news is when we find stories so i think um it's important to have that structure of a newsroom that's very important uh because that becomes the backbone and then you take out of it uh, what you need so yes it's been a big challenge to fund uh, voice pk however uh, you know there are uh, programs there are uh, funding opportunities they're small and they're very focused so i think uh, because we are working in the area of women children minorities there is an opportunity there to tap into that funding 
So from what I understand you're saying is that you're also primarily looking at international donors, but also very focused international grants maybe that are uh, human rights oriented uh, that you then use for the organization also. See, we learned from our mother organization from AGHS Legal Aid Cell that in Pakistan, usually people only fund madrasas and hospitals. They do not have the concept of funding even women who will need legal aid, what very poor, they will not, uh, who, who need legal aid. Now, for the first time, the state talks about giving uh, legal aid to women who need it. But this is a recognition of that need after a very, very long time when women have needed it for decades. For the first time, the state has recognized it. So I think that states like ours, uh, which are not completely democratic, it takes them time. And it's a, a process where they come to a conclusion that this is what our citizens need. And I think that we are filling those holes, uh, those gaps. Um, similarly, with our population, when they talk about charity work, they will you know, give a lot of food to the same mosque, same madrasa, same, uh, but they will not, uh, they will not be creative with the, with how they want it. They will not think about charity. You know, it's one thing to just throw money, but it's another thing to actually think about where your money is going and how it will uh, help people. So I think that we are not there yet. Yes, we give a lot of money away for charity, but it is the same organizations that are getting it and the same fields that are getting it. So you, you, you will not find a charity that is very few will you will find for working for uh, women's rights. You won't. So I think uh, Pakistan that way has a long, long way to go before it, it realizes exactly what people need in this country, whether there are children, whether there are women, whether there are minorities, whether they're marginalized communities, it's going to take some time. Thank you, Manise. Uh, so I think what Manise was also speaking to, Sunil, we'll come to you, uh, and what Badr and Dilrukshi also spoke about was the importance of well, yes, we're all relying on international donors at the moment, but also the importance of creating local funds, uh, which is the kind of work that Sunil, your organization does, right? Uh, so first, two things, if you could speak to. Uh, firstly, like, our lo is local funding uh, in the way that your organization does? Do you think it's a more sustainable model than relying simply on uh, donor-driven international funds? Uh, and secondly, Clearly, there is something different happening in India that is not happening in Sri Lanka or Pakistan or other countries of South Asia. What do you think the main difference is, if you could comment on that? Uh, Sunil, I think your mic is muted. Yes. Uh, to, uh, this foundation, we do not have any international collaboration for funding. We do not have any international donors. In fact, uh, media in India uh, cannot uh, uh, rather look at any kind of donor funding from international organizations. For that, there is a huge process and uh, that is, I think, in a way forbidden in the country. So the funding that we have is completely locally generated. It is from Indian philanthropists across the country. And uh, that is what we uh, use to uh, fund the online news media who apply to us. So we have been in the uh, scenario now, as I mentioned, for more than five, six years. And we have almost uh, over 40 organizations uh, have uh, benefited from this foundation's funding. And uh, a, a lot of that uh, is to organizations across uh, different uh, genres of uh, journalism, whether they are in the uh, whether they are in the community space or political and uh, 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 news analysis and opinion kind of uh, news sites, or whether they are very niche sites in the legal space or in fake news, even in the environment space. So we are kind of identify different genres and try and fill in those gaps. We also look at the underserved areas in the country, whether it is the Northeast of India or even in Kashmir, we have uh, funded uh, entities who are practicing independent journalism there. 
but you know, when it comes to the sustainability of uh, sort of checking what how sustainable this organization economically is what are some of the factors that you look uh, that you're looking at are you just looking at the mindset that these journalists are coming in with is it a business oriented mindset or are you looking at diverse revenue streams or how uh, how many people visit the website like what does that look like for you yes uh, all, all all of these factors are important uh, at the core of it is the journalism they practice uh, which is extremely important and Along with that, we uh, definitely evaluate them on how they've gone about uh, looking at the business. So whether they have been in a position to set it up as an organization, do they have a team which is there? Or are they just lone rangers? We have not funded anybody who comes in uh, saying that they have set up a website and they have friends who contribute to it and uh, that's how they are uh, right now going about. So we, we don't uh, fund those kind of organizations as much as those which have been led by entrepreneurial journalists who have shown leadership. So leadership is uh, a very important criteria that they will be in a position to manage and build a team or uh, their ability to handle finances, their ability to handle the revenues uh, side. Uh, when I say ability to handle revenue and finances, they should be able to appreciate that at least and be in a position to have somebody focusing on that. So all of these factors are extremely important for us to be able to look at them for funding. And uh, this, uh, the process is uh, such that we believe that organizations today, if they have to be sustainable from a long-term point of view, the uh, revenues are not going to come easy in the internet space. It is going to be a challenge. And uh, whether to look in at revenues coming in from advertising or subscriptions, uh, it's not so easy to build. So they will require time. So we fund organizations for about uh, three years. Uh, the first year uh, we fund them, uh, it's, and all of this is a matching grant. So we look at what are their current revenues and what is the extent of scaling up that they uh, would like to do. And we evaluate them. There's a fair amount of due diligence that goes on uh, in this process. And once we have uh, determined that uh, this organization uh, can uh, look at scaling up, then in the first year, uh, we would match their funding almost to the tune of about 50 to 60%. So they would then be in a position to uh, really move much faster than what they would if they were going it alone and scale up much faster. The second year, our level of involvement goes lower. Uh, we expect them to increase their revenues. And uh, similarly on a third year. So it is like a depleting uh, in, uh, involvement that we have with uh, the organization. And by the fourth year, we expect the entity to stand up on its own uh, to break even. And it's not that they always break even. By fourth year also, they perhaps could be struggling, but that gap is brought down to at least about 15, 20%. They are, uh, by that time, have built a team, are a little more sustainable. And uh, we also guide them along the way to look at other revenue streams. And so during the three-year phase, we guide them on uh, looking at different models that are there today. And one of the major things is reader revenues. Uh, we believe today uh, readers are willing to pay for content that they believe in, content that they trust. And uh, to that extent, uh, advertising has become less of uh, a component in their overall uh, a revenue stream, or it is slowly being taken over by subscriptions, by reader donations, 
the membership fee, which uh, membership uh, also, which Badar talked about, there also you could generate revenues. So, and social media, uh, we find increasingly most of our grantees today uh, are present even on social media uh, through, the, through YouTube, through Facebook, uh, through Instagram, and we encourage them so that their reach increases and that ensures that they are able to build in a fair amount of uh, audiences, which can then be monetized for revenues. And so they are a fair chunk of them have a very strong presence through their YouTube channels. And that's a good revenue stream. Our reader donations has uh, over the last four or five years, I would say, has improved tremendously for most of our grantees, where uh, readers, where that component has substantially increased. And uh, I, I would say today for the success of any of these online media entities, it's important uh, that they look at reader revenues more than they would look at advertising. Thank you, Sunil. That's, that's some really good insight. Um, so I think one of the things that uh, Sunil also mentioned is the criteria that his organization maybe looks at, at what a good, sustainable, successful journalism organization would look like. Uh, Dilrukshi, in your understanding of how do you measure your own sustainability and your own success and growth as an organization, are you uh, looking at uh, the amount of journalists you're uh, coming at, if they're, if they're increasing, is that a success in your book? Or are you looking at the clicks that you get on your website? Like, how do you measure success and growth? I think our metrics are really different and uh, possibly uh, we are a little fortunate as well, perhaps, because the frequency of daily, uh, you know, developing stories is not our thing. Uh, we are not a news website. We're not running a news operation. So investigative stories will take time. So that, that's a two way street, um, uh, Amal, I think, at least in this country with a small media market that we have. Uh, we have chosen, we have, we have selected uh, the option of working with media houses and journalists who want to come to us and work with us and also to collab uh, collaborate and develop our own content. So what is success to us? It is definitely uh, one way of measuring our success is the kind of um, people we draw towards the organization who want to be trained, who want to collaborate on stories. There are, there are at least a few, few journalists today who are consistently working on thematic issues, but you know, they are not out there to be seen. They have been working on these stories for a number of months. So that needs that initiative needs to be supported and to make those connections and to be able to work with, uh, you know, uh, watchdog organizations to uh, organizations with ex uh, great expertise who would come and help us to develop stories. So that's one. And uh, of course, uh, if you look at the analytics, it's really good to have certain stories, do, uh, you know, to find certain stories doing well. One of our environmental in, uh, investigations had some something like uh, over 6, 600,000, uh, you know, clicks. So that's, that's really great. great. But I also think it's also about choosing the platform that was also because of the placement you if you if you publish it in a local newspaper or a website that probably may not have that same impact so we definitely appreciate the fact that people want to read that kind of content so success is also the kind of collaborations we get and the, uh, when, when i say collaborations uh, and and that is also individuals organizations and also platforms we are right now in the process of working with multiple platform uh, platforms international platforms also uh, particularly to make sure that the stories can be placed you know and, and, you know the, the, the story can be accessed by a much wider audience so if you produce content in the local language then you will have to probably translate so that is one and also outcomes for any investigative report there is, I mean, it, it's not about the promotion. It's not about uh, the paid advertisement that you run to promote the story. Uh, it is about the follow-ups and the, and the kind of ground level impact your story actually will uh, show. And uh, just to give a simple example, when we did a data-driven story sometime back, and that resulted in a ministry correcting its uh, data set. That is there in the, you know, on their public website. So I think that's outcome. Those are outcomes that investigative journalists can actually treasure because it's it's not about the money, it's not about the clicks, it's it's really not just only about the views. It's about your audience, your engagement, 
and how far you reach and the impact you create. So for me, the metrics are very different. Right, and I would like to pose the same question, Badr, to you. Like, what does uh, what does success look like? How do you measure growth? How do you measure success at Tata? Uh, I totally agree with Dil Rukshi. I think uh, <clears throat> the best uh, matrix for engaging your success is engagement. How how successfully do you engage with your audience in a strong, sustainable manner that they are willing to put their money? Uh, in, in, in your effort, in your story. So that I think is the biggest measure. And I think that is uh, not very easy as uh, Munizia has rightly pointed out. People in Pakistan are not really uh, very fond of uh, funding uh, independent news media organizations. Uh, perhaps there is uh, no news media organization right now which is being funded by people across Pakistan. Uh, so this is an experiment against the kind of uh, grain of the circumstances. So it's not easy, but I think this is the only way of uh, being sustainable in the foreseeable future or in the long term. Otherwise, you can get grants uh, now, but tomorrow the grants might dry up because of the national and international situations, or you might tire of uh, you know doing uh, what the grant-making organizations want you to do. They, they always have certain uh, uh, kind of stories that they want to push uh, rather than other stories that you would want to do. So that conflict also uh, starts developing at some stage or the other. Uh, similarly, there are other revenue streams like, uh, like the one that we are trying right now of uh, producing uh, content for others and trying to make money out of that. That is also very, very like uh, labor intensive. You cannot find a lot of time for that. You cannot always find the human resources to do that. So, so engagement is not just the matrix for success for us. It's also the matrix that can eventually be the source for stability and sustainability for the organization. Thank you, Badr. Um, Manisha, the same question to you. Like, what does uh, success look like? What does growth look like? What does success look for uh, look like for you guys at Voice? Okay, I'm not sure. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the question really is, what does success look like for you, for us? Yes. Well, for us, we've, uh, you know, we are also a new organization. We only began in 2000 and uh, late 2019. So we, ha we haven't had that much time. But for us, what success looks like is, uh, for instance, uh, I'll give you one example. We've uh, we've been very lucky in the sense that the victims that have come to us and some stories that we have found, we have uh, developed advocacy work around that. So in one case, we had this one uh, Farah Shaheen, a minor girl. She was picked up, she was from Faisalabad and she was picked up by, um, she was a Christian girl. She was picked up by this, uh, it was a gang almost, uh, and extremists, they were uh, uh, fundamentalists. And she was forcibly converted to Islam and then married off to an older man, 50 years old. And when our reporters went there, they realized that she was actually kept as a slave in their house. So we did a story on it. And at that time, our lawyers were shooed away. When they went to lodge an FIR, the father was told, aren't you happy that your daughter has now been converted to Islam, that she's become Muslim? And you know, he was abused literally. So um, when we did the story uh, at that time, the Senate chairman, Mustafa Nawaz Koka read the story and he said to me uh, that, you know, we are going to summon the IG and ask him why they are not uh, lodging the FIR. The FIR was lodged as a result, the IG was called and the girl was produced before a magistrate. And then there was a DNA test to determine her age. And it obviously turned out that she was a minor. And at that time, it was very difficult for us because they were saying, oh, she's converted to Islam. So we said, yes, we, uh, she may have converted to Islam, but that does not mean she cannot go back to her parents, her father. So the girl was actually ordered to be sent back to her father and she was repatriated. That is the first real big success story for us that happened. Then in another case, there was a honor killing of a young woman. And she was, it was a horrible case. Uh, the girl was buried alive with her newborn child, literally by her own father and brother. 
and uh, uh, nobody would lodge an FIR in that case either. So we did a story and um, uh, uh, one of the PTI lawmakers read the story and uh, she contacted us and she said, you know, what has happened here? So we, they then said that the child, we were representing the girl and then the newborn baby was represented by the state. It never really happened. They never really followed through. They made a statement at that time, but they never really uh, gave uh, counsel to the little uh, baby. So anyway, we ended up representing both the mother and the child. And in that case, at least the case moved forward. So in our cases, now these are just two examples that I've given, but in our cases, uh, especially in the students' cases, we've done stories on students who've been picked up, who've been um, uh, enforced disappearances. We've done stories on that and mainstream media picked those up. So there was a, we generated, we managed to generate a debate about it, especially about the sedition law. So I think in that way, we have been, um, uh, luckily we've been very successful with our advocacy because we've married the media part with advocacy and with legal aid. So, um, and we have had success from across political parties uh, because they've realized that we are, what we're doing is, uh, you know, genuinely reaching out to victims of violence. So I think that there are takers. When you do speak, when you do engage with politicians, they will engage with you and they will try and help out. There is a genuine uh, desire to see uh, things improve. But unfortunately, if these are individual cases, but if you look at, the broad spectrum of what is happening in Pakistan, the laws that have been made, there has been no structure to implement them. And that is why we can say one, two, three, but actually we can't really, unless, and, and we, we, we brought in policymakers on webinars to say, look, you are making laws, but what about the structure? You have to build that structure to implement those laws. But I think for them, it is, oh, you're given, a, you're given some accolades because you make that law and it's, it's a good thing. I'm glad that they're making those laws. But they're not really thinking about how to implement them. And they're not even putting uh, uh, you know, funding uh, aside to implement them, which is very worrisome. Thank you, Manise. Um, I mean, I think what you're saying ultimately is that you look at the impact uh, that your stories also produce, especially in terms of policy and advox uh, in terms of the advocacy work that you do. Um, okay, since we're like going towards the end of the webinar, we have a couple of questions that I would like to take. So Neil, there's one question that's specifically for you where somebody wants to know if they don't, uh, if they don't have initial funding, uh, how and uh, to even set up an organization, how do they approach an organization like yours to be able to get that funding or to start setting something up? Uh, the question is that they don't have any funding yeah, initiative. For journalists who have, who have no money to even like set up uh, something like a small newsroom, where do they go? And I think that is like quite a popular question that we're getting here. Yeah, it is a very popular question. We have quite a few uh, journalists, individual journalists who come say that we would like to start uh, and this is what we would want to do. Can you fund us? Uh, no, see, as an organization, uh, we are looking at, apart from journalism and journalism with impact, we are also looking at uh, a long-term uh, sustainability. And when we are talking about sustainability, we uh, our entire approach is like that of an investor. Our funding is completely philanthropic funding. We don't take any equity from any organization, but we would expect them to be sustainable from a long-term point of view so that uh, we have had issues with individuals. We have tried this model, uh, somebody who had, uh, because the cost of entry into the internet space is, the, is very low. Entry barriers are extremely low. Anyone can get into that space. So we have tried this model with a couple of uh, people, but we have not succeeded because they are not in a position to look at the other aspects of the business. So when we, we have now focused on institution building, we would like our success really will be measured both from the impact of the journalism today, uh, as well as after we have stopped funding if they, we would want them to be still around 10 years later. And that is when we would say, yes, our funding has helped this organization come up and 
it is a force to reckon with. Uh, in terms of impact, in fact, the entities that we support today in India, uh, if you really look at their traffic and the audience reach that they have been able to generate, it would be extremely small compared to most of the mainstream media websites in the online space. Yet, they are a very powerful voice. Their share of voice is so large that they in fact set the agenda for mainstream media on various issues. And that is something which uh, we are proud of today of what uh, our grantees have been able to do in that space. So individuals, uh, is something which we have not yet really tried. Thank you, Steve. So another question that I think uh, is open to all panelists to answer is, um, especially the editors that we have over here, is how do you sort of, uh, when especially when an operation grows larger and you get more and more donors or funding, sources of funding coming in, how do you maintain transparency? Because on the one hand, you have to survive, right? Uh, so how picky can you be about who you're choosing to get money from, and also how do you ensure transparency with funding then? So, uh, Dilrukshi, we can start with you. Uh, Amal, we haven't had a lot of uh, lot of uh, you know donors, so that's uh, one thing. And uh, uh, you're right about the uh, transparency question, but I think if anybody wants that kind of information. Uh, we should be able to share that information irrespective of the consequences. We all live in uh, very difficult times, but uh, there, there are very multiple risks that ride with that. But uh, that information, uh, the organizations do understand when they choose to, uh, you know, uh, support organizations like ours. Investing in investigative journalism for a donor can also be high risk, can we, we understand that. But uh, in, in terms of transparency, so you, you can actually request for that kind of information. And also uh, our growth within one year, suddenly, uh, that reminded me of what happened at CIR. When we started, we had nothing in one year. Uh, it suddenly had multiple uh, you know, programs to run. And uh, we make a commitment to thematic areas. And then those who work and contribute to the development of that theme. Uh, you know, people will know it's a small market, a small space, small donor community. It's uh, very obvious, and uh, we do not conceal that. So uh, also, uh, when you visit a website, you can see who supports what, right? We also get a lot of facts for that kind of information sharing, uh, for the kind of uh, transparency in terms of, you know, identifying certain donors, because some don't like who, you know, support organizations. So that is all that that happens. But I just wanted to uh, add something, if you don't mind. And that's about, you know, a lot of people think you had to fundraise just from the point of, you know, your own, your organization only. And I think Sunil might, uh, might agree, but you can actually fundraise uh, as a collective. You know, there, there are people who push uh, proposals, you know, they, you, you, you take little chunk, there are areas that are dedicated to investigative journalism. Nobody funds investigative journalism per se. Nobody does that. So you have to uh, kind of give, uh, give, give a proposal that is more uh, rounded. It has multiple aspects to training, to research, to, you know, stories that you produce. And uh, as he said, sustainability, you have to pay bills, you have to pay for the, for, the, for the members who are running that operation. So to do that, there is nothing to say that I want that whole pie, you know, it's mine. But uh, I think that part of the success is also in working with others, like-minded others, to make sure that you have the bigger program, but we take that investigative journalism component and we're very happy with that. Right, thank you, Drikshi. I think that also answers the question that if you're an individual looking for funding, then maybe look to opportunities where you can collaborate with others uh, to sort of build that platform. Uh, but then I think you might also have something to speak about transparency at Sujak. Like how do you continue to grow financially as an organization and then also maintain financial transparency? I think that is another challenge that uh, the startups like us always face. Uh, let's be very clear about it. No money that anyone gives you, whether they are an investor, whether they are a lender, whether they are a donor, whether they are your readers, no one will give you money without any expectations or without any conditionalities or without any strings. If the reader gives you money, they will have certain expectations from the kind of journalism that you do. If a grant making organizations gives you money, they will have their own mandate within which that grant 
will be then uh, you know treated and considered if an investor gives you money they will always consider uh, the potential for growth and potential for profits in your uh, venture and if uh, an individual donor or individual donations are given to you they are always uh, based on the kind of journalism you do or the kind of uh, issues that you uh, raise so no money that you will ever get will be like uh, dished very freely on a platter to you you will have to work for it and work with it so that is where your first dilemma comes in what kind of money you will accept and what kind of money you will not accept uh, what kind of money will hamper your growth in the long run what kind of money will uh, help your growth in the long run and what kind of uh, grants you can take which uh, help you uh you know focus on your own niche area of journalism and what kind of grants can divert you from that so uh these are the challenges and these are the questions that every new media uh, organization has to uh, really focus on but having said that i think the journalists also need to diversify their skills in the sense that they just uh, uh, not focus on their reporting skills or their editing skills they also need to learn some management also they also need to understand uh, handling of finances also they also need to understand the human resources aspect of it so unless and until you do all these things together you forget about taking your platform forward and make it uh, grow in the medium term and in the long term but having said all of this i would say this is a proposal or this is a, an effort for only for the long haul if you are in it for the next 5 or 10 years only then you probably will be able to achieve some of the goals that you have set for yourself but if you are in it for a very short period of time for 2 or 3 years and you think that you will survive that period on grants or something like that maybe that's not a good option at all maybe you know you will not get even those grants that you are aiming for thank you brother that was extremely insightful um we're running out of time we do have some more questions but i think we'll stop here uh, thank you everybody for taking out the time to be a part of this discussion uh, i hope this was fruitful for the audience listening i hope everybody had opportunity to learn something uh, and take something away from it you can always write to us uh, at gijn.org or hello at gijn.org if you have any more questions about this discussion or pertaining to investigative journalism uh, we're open to answering more questions we have a bunch of resources for independent journalists uh, who are, who want to maybe start an organization uh, that we can send your way uh, thank you we're going to end here please uh, i'm going to send the website link in the chat for anybody who is interested thank you everybody thank you to the panelists have a great day goodbye thank you thank you bye bye thank you very much goodbye